Our final speaker today uh, is Michael Whitehead. Uh, Michael is the head of Agri Insights for the ANZ uh, Banking Group, and uh, I'd like to welcome Michael to the floor. Dopamine. Dopamine is the chemical in your brain that is generated when you take your first sip of beer or wine. That is the chemical that your brain is starting to anticipate now. Um, that is why the first taste always tastes best, um, because that's what happened. Look it up. That's how it works. And that's what always is the thing that your brain is doing when this last person gets up on stage at the end of a very long day. So to liven things up, Richard, thank you for putting the banker up on stage, um, just to finish it off. Um, but in a way, as everybody's been establishing their agri-credentials, uh, just to give themselves some credibility in a room like this, um, and there's a, a number of, of us here who've known each other for years, um, I am a Western Victorian sheep and cattle farmer by background. And I was particularly um, thinking about this ANZ, as you may have seen in some of the papers, made the papers a bit recently. but. Um, and, and I was thinking one of the things that came out recently, if anybody criticises my talk, it will show that baldism is alive and well in the agri-sector. Those of you who read the Fin Review will get that. Um, but uh, ANZ has been through a really big restructure and a lot of people have gone and we're being invited to, we're being required to do more work with less people. Um, and that reminded me of being a sheep farmer. If any of you can remember when you were trying to drench crotchety old ewes in about 35 degree heat, you get so angry that even the dogs go home and you've got to do the rest yourself. Um, it's a feeling that uh, is familiar some of these days. But uh, as far as being the last person up on stage and, and from a bank perspective, why do we get the guy from the bank up to talk about uh, digital technology in the supply chain and from an agri perspective? Which way do I push? There we go. Cool. Um, and this is a slide that I think that uh, Phil had before, so I won't go into detail too much uh, in it in terms of the... Uh, in terms of the improvements and the changes of uh, capabilities and exponential growth. But why is the bank up here today? I'm, I could touch on a lot of points today. Um, your bank and your supply chain in everybody's business, your supply chain or your ecosystem is an essential part. Um, it's a part you can't avoid. And there are three main points I want to touch upon as quickly as possible as I can today in the talk this afternoon. One that's been talked about a lot right from this morning is the, is the term interoperability or integration. How do we get all these points of these data points of the entire chain to integrate with each other, to best talk to each other, to make things as efficient as possible? And what role does the bank play in that? The second one is the role of that data will play in helping to bring new capital into the sector. We've talked and we've talked and the media talks and talks about new capital and new entrants into the sector. What role does data and the bank play in that and increasing trust for the new capital? And the third one is the term of working capital. How with new data in your operation um, or in operations down the supply chain, can it help to make businesses so much more efficient that they can tap into working capital and increase your revenue out of that? So the bank, as far as the bank's role in this, um, as I said, it's essential. The, the bank plays a role in finance. The bank plays a role in trading and risk management. But one of the other things, uh, let me put it bluntly, we're big as far as banks, whether it's ANZ or any of the other banks as well. And in the sheer scale that we have, um, when you take farming, such a disaggregated sector, but for a country like Australia with four major banks as well, what this means, the sheer scale of data that a bank generates on a daily basis and has the capability of, of generating, um, it's way beyond credit card data, it's way beyond supply chain data, FX, interest rates as well. And the challenge now, as everything increases exponentially, somebody talked before, it might have been Ross this morning, that said um, that uh, farming and agriculture is behind everything in terms of utilisation of data. You could say that banks have an enormous challenge too to create the algorithms, to create the correlations as well, to look at using data better. I mean, one circumstance, and I, uh, in the way that Phil asked a few questions before, I might ask a couple. I won't ask, has anybody here, look, yeah, put up your hand if you've been somewhere overseas and suddenly your credit card hasn't worked despite the fact you haven't done anything wrong. 
Yeah, oh, good heavens. I, I, I offer an apology. Um, and that is because an algorithm um, has decided that something you bought the day before or something that happened was a bit suspect and shut it down. And those are being worked on. Those are being worked on. You would be amazed at the amount, of, and I, I know the statistics, the amount of security triggers that go off within a bank every day is immense. Um, because the data generates and the algorithms generate that something's going wrong. But, but banks are involved in, the, in that entire ecosystem because of the sheer scale. Um, it is in the interest of a bank to make sure in utilising this data and making sure it interacts with, say, AgriData and other sectors, that the bank creates as much positive business out of that and that comes from clients improving their businesses. And the last point, and I don't say it just because one should, but there's a social responsibility too. There is a social responsibility to make sure with that market power that things go as well as possible. So in pushing through things at a reasonable space, some of you may remember a few years ago, about five years ago, we put out a report called Greener Pastures. Um, it, it came out five years ago and it's still oft quoted. And in that Greener Pastures report, one of the things that we modelled was that for Australia to achieve its full potential in an agri sense, to achieve uh, producing the full demand for our agri, we would need to find an extra $1 trillion in capital outside traditional sources by 2050. And we break that down into $600 billion would be required to improve our current farming assets and $400 billion would be required for the turnover or the sale of those farming assets as well. What's interesting, we have it up there, is that the FAO in their own report looking at developing countries to achieve their potential as well said that $9 trillion would be required. Uh, I do have to say, and in credit to the AFI, the only people who came out and the only person who came out and questioned some of those figures was Mick. Is he still here? Is he in the room? Um, yes, and I love the fact that someone digs into the modelling that much, probably discounted it by 20 million or something. But we modelled that. Right now you look at those needs. Let us talk from a global perspective about liquidity. The world is awash in liquidity. The world is awash in capital that is looking for somewhere to park itself. Um, globally, I think back to last year uh, when I was at the Global Ag Investing Conference in New York. Jay was there, I think, uh, Jock as well. And we stood in a room, this is indicative, at the Global Ag Investing Conference in New York in the Waldorf Astoria. Um, we were in a room giving a presentation on Australian agri and other things and sitting out there where you're sitting were about 800 people. But they manage, they have assets under management of $3.5 trillion had come along to that room to learn how to put some of their capital into agriculture. One room in New York alone. It is indicative of the fact this capital wants to be in agriculture. It is increasingly looking at Australia. Don't worry about the whole argument of Australian superannuation funds not putting their money into agriculture. That's a whole separate issue. That's their decision as well. The capital is there. Where does this relate to the data? How does this relate to what we're talking about today? What does data mean to a financial manager out there? A chief information officer, a pension fund out of Canada, a university endowment fund out of Texas, a family office out of Hamburg. It means that they can have an increased level of trust and they can have more faith to put their capital into your operation, into an agri operation, into somewhere in the supply chain. We see in the media, and a lot of us know personally how much is coming, there is a lot more off the radar that's doing due diligence and with an increased level of data to satisfy their faith and their trust, that is really going to increase and enhance that flow of capital and our productivity. That's one side. The other side is for the new entrants. And a number of people today have raised the point, how do we get, whether it's new entrants or young farmers or young people, onto the agricultural assets, onto farms they may want to be on. And the problem for many of them is these banks once again. You come from Sydney or Melbourne, you've decided you want to change your lifestyle and move to Hamilton. I'd encourage you to move to Hamilton, Western Victoria, great town. You want to move out there, you want to run a merino operation, you have no history at all um, in running merinos, but you've studied well and you think you're capable of doing it. And sometimes a lot of us have to agree, people outside ag with their non-emotional links can bring great skills to run these operations. But you also have no farm to lend against. If we look hypothetically down the track that the operation you're looking at has the levels of data 
ranging from the sensors, uh, ranging through the market data as well, ranging through so many more details, data and digital generated from this operation to satisfy your banker, then you have much more chance of being forwarded the capital to get into there, and this has much more of a chance to make an impetus to get new entrants into the agri-sector. In many ways, I'm condensing what's a sophisticated argument, but what we are seeing, and in ANZ it's a very big thing, particularly with our regional and rural side, we've got about 20% market share, um, the same as two of the other major players, the others aren't far behind, about 20,000 farmers. We are as keen as anyone to get new people on if they can satisfy with data the risk uh, gradings that are expected. So that's one way of, of looking at things from terms of new entrants. There we go. Now, the bank's always been part of the supply chain. Um, if this is a, just a basic feedlot model taken from one of our, our feedlots, but if we applied this to a basic grain supply chain, a dairy supply chain anywhere, and the role of the bank in terms of uh, the role it plays. From an ANZ perspective, as you've seen, we've changed CEOs recently. This is an ad, isn't an ad, this is a sign of how important this is to ANZ, CBA, NAB and everyone. We've gone from focusing on super regional being the answer to everything, uh, expanding into China, expanding into Asia. That is still fundamentally important. But for ANZ, the number one thing at the moment, and for the other bank banks, is data utilisation. It's, it's really the key focus. Um, it is taking on whole new data teams. It is expanding your spending on data teams to work out where your algorithms can be. Um, as I said, if Agri has a lot to improve on in terms of data, so does banking. Where will this change the way that banks work with you and what will this mean for the integration? Now, hands up again if at some point your bank manager has come out to the kitchen table at the farm, you've had a cup of tea, a piece of fruitcake, sat down, gone over, none of you? None of you have had your RM come out? And particularly when your, your, your relationship manager, RM, um, came out, uh, arrived going too fast in the White Falcon down the driveway, too much gravel, and then you went over your books, some familiar, yeah, it was the stock agents who did that too. They always went too fast. And you went over the books as well. Where will the bank and the, of the future work with the data coming out of your operation and where will the challenges for integration be? We've talked about the points of data generation and we've talked about the technologies, whether it's sensors, whether it's be what's coming out of uh, the robotics, whether it's be what's coming out of the, the market data that Nathan talked about before. The challenge in future is that our, that relationship manager may not come to your farm anymore because your farm will talk automatically to your bank. Your bank's computers and your bank's data systems will know absolutely what you're doing at any point even in real time, which we'll talk about shortly. It will mean that you are able to instantly look at how your capital position's changing uh, and your capital ability to use capital's changing as well. So in terms of a bank integrating, how will this change? And, and the interoper interoperability. We're not moving as quickly as some would expect. And the reason for this, um, and it's been talked about before, is we need to make sure we as a banking system that our systems tie into the agri-systems and the underlying structure as closely as possible so it is as seamless as possible. The market in the end always looks after these things and the market will do so. I've only heard the name Joyce once today, but I raise it because um, for those who read the white paper as well, I think the, the, was it the white paper or the green paper on agri? It had three points, infrastructure, telecommunications, water as well. The telecommunications one, is it a bigger role for government to come and work out and facilitate what that interaction will be? The banks will play a major role in that because it's, it's important for us. It's in a formulative stage. The regulator will play a major role in that as well, won't he, Mick, um, with your new hat on? So in terms of what we're looking at from ANZ, we're working with a lot of the major universities. That University of Sydney stuff today was so good, I don't know why the rest of us bothered trying to present. Uh, it blew us so far um, out of the paddock. But we're working, we're working with uh, MIT. We've just uh, sent 20 of our key data people across to MIT to look at building data capabilities. We're working with UNSW. We're working with Monash. Um, but when we work with uh, others and doing some work with Google as well, we work off a lot of these technologies which have been used today. But as a bank, and as every bank, relating back into the, the agri-data side of things, why do we need to, to know as much as we can about these? We need to know 
the ins and outs of these technologies so that we can fund them when the clients in the agri-sector come and say we need the capital to help build our businesses. So the banks need to know about these. We need to know the cost-benefit analysis, and that's been talked about today. If the technologies are wrong, uh, from a bank's point of view for a particular client as well. And we need to be able to advise clients who aren't using them in terms of how they should be used. Uh, you could say um, that those in the service industry, for example, um, we've talked about the fact today who's going to fall behind. Uh, and I, I think Matt particularly talked about the fact there'd be winners and losers and those who are going to fall behind. We've talked today about that, and those in the service industry particularly will fall behind if they don't update themselves enough. Um, particularly, a lot of today's talks have talked about the production agri side of the whole food and agri supply chain. But what we need to increasingly do with the integration and the technology is apply it, as Nathan's talked about, to the trading, to the logistics, to the processing, and make sure that that interaction is all the way down the chain. The other thing that we need to do is be aware of the global corporate activity that is happening in the digital and data side for Agri in terms of the consolidation and the implications for particularly for our competition as Australians. Now we watch a lot of this activity closely. Uh, we watch it from a, a mergers and acquisitions angle in case a bank can play a role there. Um, we need to know what it's going to mean for clients. It's, um, but importantly, as we say, for the competition, what will some of this mean for your Black Sea region competitors in the, in the grain side of things? What will some of this mean in terms of Chinese domestic production of dairy and cattle and what that will mean? That, will sim that sounds like it's simplifying it in one way. On the back of this, uh, we are building a number of uh, agri databases uh, and algorithms as well. It's interesting in ANZ, I'll have a, a little boast as well. Um, as we build up our data capabilities, every test pilot we run is on Agri. That's partly because I'm pushy with the data team, but partly because the data team has said if there is any field where we can take literally trillions of, uh, trillions of combinations in algorithms and see a change, it's Agri. So we're running all our pilots on that. And some of the pilots we have which can map out 10 years what will happen in global trade, uh, global trade changes, prices, productions, um, is amazing, and that's still in a formulative stage. So I just wanted to, so I talked about those two things. I talked about why we were going to see data, being able to bring in new capital, and talked about integration. The last point I wanted to talk about um, was, from a bank perspective, the role of data and technology in using your working capital better in your business. There is so much work out there. For those of you who have as little social life as I do and find yourself reading finance texts all the time, there is so much work out there in terms of untapped capital coming out of working capital for lack of efficiency. What your business is worth, what you could be borrowing against, but you don't know it on a real-time basis. Um, you only do it uh, at, at far longer periods than you should, and data can allow you to do that. There was a recent Bain report that said that US companies, for example, aren't accessing almost a trillion dollars a year of their working capital. Now, data is going to be the huge point in applying this to agribusiness. Let's, in a quick example, apply it to the beef sector, both to the, the grain fed and the feedlots. And let's hypothesize, and it's been great that it's talked about, that the technology exists out there for cattle to be weighed, not just counted automatically, even if you're on an AACO scale or a Paraway scale, not just weigh, uh, counted automatically, but weighed by satellite normally. And I, I was in Singapore the other day talking to a particular company who, who say that they feel that they can weigh cattle from satellites at the moment and are just in the final stages of, the, of that as, at the moment. So if you look at the way and a, a traditional, say, feedlot operations run um, and the ability to how we should be able to change it to unlock capital, a very traditional, and this is simplifying it for the feedlot people out there, you have a traditional feedlot. You are weighing cattle on day one or day zero, you are weighing them on day 50 and you're weighing them on day 100. And you therefore know the value of your business on one, two, three occasions and you can borrow against that. Um, as we've put up the top, one of the big issues with new entrants and with a lot of cattle operations is that banks will fund, say, 60% against the land, but unless you're judged a good risk, nothing against the cattle. And even if you're a good risk, maybe 40% against the cattle. So we've looked at what the traditional model is. Now let's bring in the utilisation of data, whether in a feedlot or in a paddock. If you can, on a stress-free basis for your cattle, have them know their exact weights every day 
then the bank will on day one, day two, day three, day four, as the weight gain lifts, know the new working capital scale of your business and you can borrow against it. That will, and we, we've run a number of models of this and you can say that cattle prices fluctuate, but in doing that every year back to 2010, if that was done, the grower would come out on top and the capital released back into the business would come back on top. And then if you look at that, if you apply that to a farm on grass fed rather than in a feedlot as well, and you say we know the exact number and we know the exact weight on a daily basis, the unlocked, unlocked capital by knowing the value of your business uh, increases even further. It's basic. Um, if, you, if you put it this way, you know your risks are high loss given default and your risks are high with the likelihood of default, but if you bring down and utilize the technology, it enhances the real-time financing. Two more quick questions. How many of you would say that you understand what blockchain is? I knew there'd be so You are the clever ones. I, I, I'm intrigued that it hasn't come up today. Let me put it simply like this, and Nathan stole the example I was going to use uh, in the same way. It's about our, our parents, perhaps, or about all of us. Um, ten years ago, would you have used your credit card to buy something online, or were you a bit iffy about this internet thing? You were a bit suspicious, weren't you? Somebody was going to rip you off. Think of blockchain as this. Blockchain is the new, and people will correct me on this over a beer later on, blockchain is the new transaction facility which will allow as much as possible transactions, accreditations, everything that now takes days uh, or weeks to happen, to happen as close as possible to instantaneously. Um, it will be secure, it will allow things to move in a way they haven't done before. Um, let's think, and I know people working on it with customs, things won't get stuck in customs anymore in any country, your exports, they will go th straight through because of the accreditation. What blockchain will also mean, and from a banking point of view and from the examples I talked about before, is if we go back to the cattle example that I had here, um, and we talk about the fact that uh, we take this as an example. Here's your weight gain going up. Um, here's we're using the EYCI as an indicator, even though you wouldn't use it in the feedlot necessarily, the correlations are close. We say from January 2015 to May 2015, here's your operation. The fact that uh, prices have gone up over this time. And on every day, think, imagine every day your business is revalued. On the yellow line, the bank's lending against 85% of your business here. But that hasn't gone through to a banker. The data in your farm or in your feedlot has valued that. Through blockchain, it's talked to the ANZ or the other banks' computers as well. Straight away, the excess capital that's come out of that through blockchain and the way it's structured has been reinvested at, at an agreed rate or, or back into your business, however it's structured, and automatically, within a split second, that has released new capital back into your business. And that is the way that the banking uh, of the future will go. It's a threat for people like me uh, because we won't be needed. I am not as optimistic as the many people today, Phil and others, who said there'll still be a role for humans. I really ro uh, worry that there won't. I'll skip past that one as well to go to the final question here. Now, you've got your hand on your smartphone because you're about to check your Facebook um, and you're about to look at your messages. Could everybody please raise their smartphone in the air if you have the Tinder app on it. <laughs> I don't think there's a hundred percent honesty in this room, but I'm not going to go on. If you don't know what Tinder is, ask the Gen Y sitting somewhere in your row. The reason we raise that is this. One of the facilities that data will allow from your cattle or your other operation going forward and for a banking point of view is the one that in a way that we've mocked up here. Let's take as an example, it automatically knows. Uh, your phone knows the cattle in your feedlot, it knows what your funding capabilities are, it knows automatically what your new working capital opportunities are. Don't ring your bank, don't go to a meeting, don't sit down straight away on your phone, swipe left or swipe right and make your banking decision straight away from that and the data and the digital has generated that. So what have we gone over in this uh, brief amount of time? And thank you for staying till the end of the day. I do have to say this is the biggest crowd I've seen at the end of a Dana conference. That is not because of me. That is because Mick and the AFI have put on such a fantastic conference. Um, and by the end of the conference tomorrow, if it's the same um, quality as today, it's just going to be one of the most amazing for all our businesses. I've talked about the role of banks uh, being enormous down the chain. 
in terms of what it will do with your data. I've talked about the fact it's going to bring in those new entrants, it's going to bring in that trust uh, to enhance what banks will do with your business and that the whole system, banks will play a major role in integrating. Thank you very much for listening and look forward to joining you over a beer. Thank you.